Over the years I found out that one of the most effective ways to evaluate the impact of any kind of policy agenda is to look at if authorities also put their money where their mouth is. So let's have a look at how much money we actually have available to work on a global agenda of globalization, global equality and, and human development. Well, we surely don't have a global social security system because we also don't collect any global taxes to redistribute resources, take some from the rich and give it to the poorest in order to, you know, to provide them a minimum level of, of standard of living, to also to prevent uh, the development of extremism. I mean, if people are desperate, that is not a very good thing for global uh, stability. So we don't have a global tax system like this, so we don't really have a constant flow of money, but we have some consensus that have been agreed on. For example, in the United Nations, the Monterey consensus of 2002. Countries pledge there, especially rich countries, developed countries pledge there to dedicate at least 0.7% of their economic power to aid, to official development assistance, which is then used to create development projects in developing countries. So that's less than 1%. But the taxes are usually at 15, 20, 40 percent. So it's, 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 it's a quite small amount. But let's have a look. So in 1993, these ideas were started. Four countries in the world fulfilled this level. That was Netherlands, Sweden, Norway and Denmark. They dedicated more than 0.7 percent of their economic power uh, towards official development projects. Then 2003, about the time when this agreement was made official, uh, Luxembourg has joined them. A very small country, but at least we see some progress, right? And then uh, 10 years later, in 2013, well, we still have only five countries fulfilling that agreement. That's also because we do not have any global executive power that could force anybody to execute this agreement. It's just an agreement and, and here we are, not really any execution. So, okay, so in relative terms, it's maybe not a lot, but let's look in absolute terms at the millions and the billions of dollars that developed countries send down to developing countries constantly. And you hear that also on the news regularly, people getting really upset saying, you know what, all these billion dollars we send down there to the poor countries and they still don't get their stuff together. I mean, what are they doing? We should stop sending these billion dollars down there. They don't get off the ground. It's just like a waste. So let's have a look at at how many billion dollars we actually send down there. So at the beginning of the, 2000, the mid, early mid 2000s, 2005, uh, official development assistance was annually at about 160 billion dollars. Uh, that sounds like really a lot. Um, and that is really dedicated to implement also these global agendas, these um, reduction of poverty, equality of women, education, health, and so forth. Now, what you also have to consider that many of these developing countries, they also have debt. I mean, they run into debt. Some of these debts is really still historical from colonial times, which is really weird. And another one is then just has been added over time because you know, we started an unequal playing field, be it of histori out of historical reasons. Infrastructure had to be built, some catch up had to be made. So they needed money from that. Some, were really, some of these countries were really exploited because of colonialism. Others then just had to catch up and, and jump on the train and they needed money for that. So rich and developed countries lend them some money and for every lending of money you have to pay some debt services as well, kind of like an interest rate. So how much is the interest rate that poor countries actually pay to rich countries? In the same year that these statistics are from, it was more than $700 billion. So actually if you make a net calculation, more than $500 billion flow every year from the developing countries to developed countries. So kind of like flow from the south to the north. That's about a million dollars a minute that flow from poor countries to rich countries, not the other way around. So to give you put that in, uh, in context, for example, in 2010, there was a very big earthquake in Haiti and Haiti is still suffering with the consequences. And it is seen as a best practice because several developed countries got together very quickly to help Haiti. So it's a, seen as a best practice in, in international cooperation and development. So the United States immediately made available $100 million and the European Union made available $400 million. Now to put that in perspective, that's the equivalent of waiting for eight hours 
And, you know, the poor countries could have paid for that basically themselves. They could have helped Haiti themselves. They wouldn't have needed any rich countries if they would not be forced to pay a million dollars per minute to the rich countries. Right. So eight hours, that's all it's needed to collect 500 million dollars. To give you another comparison, uh, debt services in many developing countries is at about 5% of the economic power, 5% of GDP. That's on average as much as a country spends on health, be it public or private. Now imagine a developing country, you say, well, give 5% of your GDP and say, we don't also, we also don't have money for health care. You know, and now imagine the poor countries. That's a huge proportion of the economy and obviously you're not left with a lot of money for health, education, infrastructure and so forth. So, so as much about the argument that billions of dollars are sent to poor countries all the time and they don't, they cannot get anything off the ground, but actually because actually money is flowing from the south to the north, not the other way around. One mechanism that has increased in strength over recent times refers to the private provision of aid of international development aid, which is often referred to as philanthropy. Um, so global billionaires uh, like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, two of the two richest people on earth, uh, they, they made an official pledge to dedicate the majority of their wealth to philanthropy for development, especially also international development, that means more than 50%. And they created this pledge and um, until now more than 100, 130 billionaires, often multi-billionaires, signed up to that pledge and dedicated more than 50% of the wealth to philanthropy and very important progress has been made. That's a very important source uh, of, of resources. Often they aim at developing new technologies, uh, which is a very hands-on solution to, for example, to end poverty. So here in this book by Jeffrey Sachs, a professor in Columbia University, uh, you can see that a lot of the solutions to the end po to end poverty aim at the development of uh, irrigation system, of uh, provision of anti-malaria nets, and so forth. So these are really technically hands-on solutions that are financed, also new research and development that is financed uh, by these philanthropic initiatives to help developing countries to find standardized solutions to typical needs that they have. The standardized solutions are derived from knowledge about the world and they're embedded into a, a physical structure which then allows them to liberate resources, automate some processes without thinking about them, just using the technology and then have more resources also to tackle other problems and, and to improve their standard of living. So, but this aims at these micro level technologies because obviously with some two private sector guys, as powerful as they might be in the financial realm and the economic realm, you cannot turn the big wheels, the global systemic inequalities, the way the world is governed and the, the way the, the industrial machinery is set up. But you can provide very hands-on solutions to very real problems and a lot of progress has been made there. Sometimes these voluntary efforts are not as successful. To give you one example, for example, in the year 2003-2005, the world got together in two world summits. That means that the head of states or the presidents get together and they had two world summits on the information society. So the world talked about digitalization. I was present myself for, for many weeks in these negotiations that happened in Geneva and in Tunis. And one of the big proposals on providing a better digital global future was to create a global digital solidarity fund. Because people said, well, not everybody has, not by far not equal, but not adequate access to this digital informational wealth. And um, while you can surely not be informational rich if you don't even have access to the digital realm and you live basically in informational poverty. And that's a new dimension of poverty. It's very worrisome because, well, information is very important for many things. Some people say information is, is knowledge and knowledge is power, right? So information is, is, is very important. So one of the solutions was then, okay, let's create digital solidarity to make sure that everybody has a minimum access to, to global cyberspace. And the idea was to have a 1% tax actually to be placed on also in private sector vendors of digital technology. That means that if they produce and sell digital technologies, they would have to present a one, pay a 1% tax 
Um, and with that, it, technology could be developed and, and financed in order to provide access to the poorest of this world. And now creating a global tax this has never been made. So that proposal was off the table very quickly. Private sector technology developers, some said, OK, yeah, we go for that. Others, many others said, no, I cannot assure. I don't know. That doesn't go through. So then they said, OK, so let's at least let governments pledge that if, a, if the government buys technology, for themselves or for their people in rich countries, they also they pay one percent, and and that one percent then goes to poor countries. So it's a public digital solidarity. But not all governments were on board. So at the end, with all this resistance, people said, okay, let's let's make it voluntary, right? So if you voluntarily want to pay one percent more on buying your laptop, uh, or if a company says, well, we're producing laptops, but we just be, raise the price by 1% and, uh, and for that we can then give to digital solidarity. So we do that um, voluntarily. Now the goal was all these world development, uh, world summit goals aimed at 2015 where they would be evaluated. Now in the year 2013, if you would open the web page of the Global Digital Solidarity Fund, you would find this here, an arrow. The fund didn't have even money anymore to sustain its web page, <laughs> far, far from closing the global digital divide. So these are also some examples of what can happen if you have voluntary contributions, you know, and when the will is gone, they are certainly not sustainable.